bringing sports entertainment and technology podcasts together. This is SPNT. Irish Impact is brought to you by Stitcher Smart Radio. Download the Stitcher Smart Radio app today at stitcher.com slash SPNT. What's happening, Irish fans? Yes, I'm playing a little injured tonight. A little under the weather. I'm Nick Sudley here for Irish Impact. Episode 14. Congratulations to the Fighting Irish. Finishing the season 12-0. and We're glad you could join us. Alongside Kevin Warner and I am Nick Sudley. Kevin, what's happening, my friend? 22-13 win in the Coliseum. It's the most wonderful time <laughs> of the year. Well, we certainly had a lot to be thankful for over the weekend as oh, the yeah. Irish... Be, I mean, it really wasn't even that close. Well, I mean, it could have been a bigger win. They struggled in the red zone throughout the game. We'll talk about that. But overall, the way we've seen it all year, they were able to manage points offensively, and the defense made uh, big plays when they had to. And they get the win they needed because the pressure was definitely on building up all week. Everyone, you know, said this, you win and you're in to the national title game. Time to take their talents to South Beach. But everyone, you know, still the pundits were not – Convinced even still at 11 and 0 when the Trojans were going to host them and Notre Dame had lost nine out of ten. A lot of teams were picking USC even with a freshman quarterback for the upset. And um, Brian Kelly brought the boys in and they took care of business. They took care of business. Uh, we'll get into the game. We'll look ahead to uh, the next couple of weeks for the Irish as uh, we know that uh, our boy Manti will probably will be heading to New York mm-hmm. as a as a Heisman finalist. You're going to have to put up with this awful voice for about 40 minutes. So I do apologize up front. Hopefully, we'll get that uh, fixed over the next coming weeks. Again, you can email us. Say that email address is feedback at irishimpact.com. We'd love to hear your feedback, especially about the the game against USC. Man size chances of winning the Heisman and what your thoughts are as far as Notre Dame's upcoming opponent in the national championship game. It's not the Orange Bowl, but it's the actual national championship game presented by, what I'm assuming, FedEx or whoever the, the, the title sponsor is. Yeah, sure. It's one of those things. It's, that, you know, it's always a rotating. Thing whoever paid for it, yeah. Who drops? <laughs> who drops the biggest wad of cash? Does that one? And that's not really a concern for guys like us. We're just here to root for the Irish. See what happens. Let's talk a little bit about this game last Saturday night. Again, a big primetime game. The Irish had showed up for those so far this season with the Michigan State win on the road back when the Spartans were in the top ten. They fell off after that, obviously, and then the big win against Oklahoma on the road in Norman, and then another one when they won on the road in Boston College, just taking care of business, 21-6. And then this one, again, 22-13, everything taken care of. And the team really came to play. It was a nice strategy they were to use just running the football. The Irish come in this one and they with the win, averaging 5.3 yards per carry and led by Theo Riddick. The, it was, a, you know, when I was watching the, the, the opening drive, I thought there would be some, some jitters. You know, it's a huge game. Olsen's first time going up against USC. That's a big rivalry game. But the way they went right down the field, I was not concerned one bit with with the Irish. Um, you know, they ended up kicking a field goal after that first drive, Kev. But with ease, they went down the field. They were able to run the ball really well all night long. But in particular, that first drive, they kind of set the tone of what was going to happen throughout the night. I was not concerned one bit. And then when I saw the defense get off the field and they got the ball back, they ended up getting the touchdown from Riddick. I knew the, the game was over at that point because I didn't think offensively USC could match up against our defense. Well, the one thing that kind of made it a questionable just for a while was that they did settle for some field goals. They obviously got out to that 10 nothing lead, but they had to start settling. For, you know, it was then 10-7. to Then Brinza makes one 13-7. They answer 13-10. Brinza, they have to settle for this one, but it's a 52-yarder. He makes that one. It was nice to see him get back on track, by the way, because he had been a question mark in games as of late. He played really well on this road game, making, a, again, a 52-yarder. But even when it was 19-10 to 10 and then 19-13, to 13, it was still just concern because it was a road game that all it takes is one play and one bomb or one gaff, and USC could somehow sneak back in this one. But then they put together that drive to get the lead 22-13, a little breathing room, and then the defense stepped up on that final drive for USC. Well, let's talk about that drive first but that got him to 22 because – there was a couple runs, the the Riddick spin move, that was the, the, the drive where that happened. Arguably the key of the game, key play right, of the game. Right, exactly. They get down to the goal line, and they start throwing the ball. 
They should have kept running it. I think they were trying to catch him off guard and maybe get the quick play, but I agree with you on that. They just – and they weren't – it wasn't able to work out. But I guess Brinza had been playing so confidently, they wanted to take a shot at maybe putting him away there instead of settling for the field goal. Well, what I'm saying, though, even if you're worried relying on the field goal, run the ball and get rid of some clock. Yeah, you know? That's what I was more concerned about. Get, because get it to zeros. At that point in the game, you're so close to right. locking a trip to Miami. And you're still kind of standing on pins and needles because, you know, all it takes is a mistake and a bad snap or a helmet hits a football right? and something could go wrong. But they were able to take care of business. And then I want to get into now how great they made that defensive stand at the end of the game when USC had the option to either kick the field goal, but they had eight plays inside the 10-yard line. <laughs> and that Notre Dame defense came up big again. It's been the story of the season. And they weren't going to let them in that end zone. And it was just glorious to watch as a Notre Dame fan. How genius. And I, I don't know if this was something that they planned or if that's something that Russell did on purpose. And I, I believe it was Russell uh, who was playing cornerback against Marquise Lee. But he, two times in a row, he, he basically interfered with him in the end zone. I mean, at that point, it doesn't hurt you at all uh, because, what, you're giving up a yard and you knew... At, Better than giving up the big score. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm surprised that USC went back to, to the ground. Why didn't they continue trying to just throw it up in the air and keep drawing penalties? I'm surprised myself they kept trying to run it in on the ground. I guess maybe it had something to do with the freshman quarterback playing in the ball game. And on that last play where he tried to throw the pass to the fullback Soma of Anuku, the ball was there. The fullback didn't come up with it. It would have been a difficult catch. But you wonder if a Matt Bar- Barkley's in there, he throws a perfect strike. You know. Well, I don't know. if I, Again... All four of those plays were just fantastic plays by the defense. I, the, the, you're right. On the fourth down, the play was there. He I mean, it would have been it. a difficult catch, but it was definitely catchable. I mean, but if it, you hit your hands, you got to catch yeah, it, right? Yeah, you saw the ball bobble and hit the ground, and then defense just started running off the field, jumping up and down, because that was the moment there. Because USC could have opted to kick for three, get back within uh, one score in the ball game. You know, a couple minutes left, maybe their defense makes a stand. Instead, Coach Kiffin goes for this chance here, because if you can't punch it in, from inside the two-yard line, they're probably not going to be able to do it again. Right. I just like that when they were running off the field, Brett Musburger claimed at the goal line stand of the ages, for the ages. <laughs> I mean, it was a good goal line stand, don't get me wrong, but I thought the Stanford one was better. Yeah, but, I mean, this one, the Stanford one was obviously huge. This one just had the implication of going to the right. national championship game and against USC, one of the Notre Dame's biggest rivals, and Notre Dame's been on the downside of it. So to go into the Coliseum of all places – and just shut them down at the gate. It was a beautiful thing. <laughs> it was very beautiful. I mean, I've never screamed. Again, now you know why I'm so hoarse. <laughs> you know, I did a lot of screaming on Saturday. did a lot of screaming on Sunday as I watched a former USC quarterback get trounced <laughs> in Carson Palmer. But that's neither here nor there. Again, the Irish big-time winners, uh, you know, a lot of people doubted them all season long, uh, particular uh, a person named Rick Riley, which we'll get into in just a minute. But – when you look back overall throughout the entire season, Kev, I mean, you and I at the beginning we didn't predict. Neither one of us predicted twelve and zero. I don't even. I don't even think I predicted nine wins. I think I said eight and five. You'd be pretty hard pressed to find anybody who would honestly come out and tell you they did predict twelve and zero for this Notre Dame team with the kind of schedule they had before them and the question marks that laid ahead at the beginning of the season in August with a freshman quarterback and Everett Golson, with. Questions at wide receiver with the only really go-to guy that was reliable being Tyler Eifert with the secondary losing guys before they even played it down. So I had him going into the season at 8-4 and four with losses to Michigan State, who was highly touted as a top-10 team. <laughs> Oklahoma, who still is a very tough football team. With no defense. Stanford, another tough team. Very and, team. and the Trojans, who were preseason number one, who obviously had a disappointing Ouch. year in their eyes. So, And Notre Dame was able to beat those four teams and eight more, and here we are, 12-0. and 0. You know what I like about the the USC win is that I think it sets the tone for the series here coming up in the next few years because they're still experiencing a lot of those uh, scholarship restrictions from Mm -hmm. the sanctions. So this is our chance to really get back and kind of even up the series because 9 out of 10 really stinks, Yeah, you know, but... It's nice to take now 2 out of 3 in a row in the Coliseum and with Brian Kelly bringing in recruits that are going to be more suitable for his offense as this thing moves along, you got to have confidence in this Notre Dame program, obviously. Well, I think not only just offensively, I think defensively. Oh, sure, They're sure. sending a huge message throughout the country that if you're a good defensive player, you got to go to South Bend. Especially with the way college football seems to pan out on every Saturday where just having these basketball-esque scores and Oregon's 
are putting up, you know, 60 points to still only win by 10 or West Virginia's and Kansas State's who they are all touted teams. But when they had to play defense, they give up points to some much weaker opponents who were just able to move the ball on them. And Notre Dame sends messages and wins football games 17-14, 17-10, 21-6. Those are tough, fought-out football games, and they all start with great defense. I think that's why it bodes well for them in the title game because – They've already played a lot of close games this year, but Alabama's played, what, two? Mm-hmm. Two close games you know, against Texas A&M, which they lost. A close game against LSU, so I think it bodes well for the Irish. Yeah, the Irish have seen almost every type of scenario throughout this season. They've had big wins in a blowout fashion against Navy and Wake Forest, and then they've had very close ones with the BYU, Stanford, the goal line stand. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, where they were able to come from behind. They had to go through that kind of game. So they've seen a little bit of everything, and the players have all – really shined through it and you've seen every guy get a little better each week and it just is a testimonial to the coaching staff and to the players on the team well we kind of mentioned rick riley a couple minutes ago you know somebody that has doubted the irish he would wondered uh earlier in the season whether or not the irish were relevant well i i believe that notre dame kind of answered that question but we did get an email this week from brian dietzel he he asks what do you guys think about Rick Riley's comments at the beginning of the year? Notre Dame is not relevant. I was at the game in Dublin with 50,000 Irish fans following the band through the Temple Bar area, and we were laughing about calling them not relevant. Now, 11 weeks later, and we are number one in the BCS and number one in graduation rates, Notre Dame is always relevant, especially today. Go Irish. Thanks, Brian, for your email. Uh, Kev, we've, we've kind of talked about it with Rick Riley and – He's had a rough couple of weeks, <laughs> especially on Twitter. But uh, I don't know. I don't know if any of that had to contribute to what happened this year. But he's a man of his word. He went to South Bend, I believe, today to go shine some helmets. Well, I mean, we talked about it on the very first time with the mics hot on the first podcast we did here on Irish Impact, and we that article had come out, and we were a little perturbed about it because how could he say such a thing? And then it's still a front page article. And everyone's still talking about Notre Dame, even then going into a season where people like us had said, you know, they're going to be good, not great, eight and four kind of predictions like that. They're still very much relevant. National TV contract. Every road game is broadcast, primetime television. And so we knew that going in. And Rick Riley, you know, maybe just a little bit off his game as he gets a little older because he could have wrote this article any season but this season and maybe been justified. He picked the wrong year to put the pen to paper or the fingers on the keyboard and print this one out. He said, Notre Dame, it was time to turn in their tiara, and they're a month away from playing for a crown. I think it's funny that his <laughs> – I don't know if you have a chance to check his Twitter profile lately. His tagline says, wait, that's what that riddle, little red light means? <laughs> <laughs> that's a reference to uh, you know something that happened on ESPN a couple weeks ago on Monday Night Football, and Rick Riley's reporting. But Well, at least he's got a little bit of sense or humor about it. That's not too bad. Usually right. his jokes fall flat. <laughs> so, Rick Riley's a legendary sports writer, but, I mean, he's as he's kind of left Sports Illustrated, now works for ESPN. He has decent articles. I like what he writes about when he covers golf. I'm a fan of P.J. Golf. And, but when he gets into these other sports, sometimes he's off his element and out of his you know comfort zone and maybe, maybe let someone else write these articles. <laughs> maybe let somebody else cover... Monday Night Football. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Just saying. Well, hey, we want to hear your thoughts about the Irish and their, their 12-0 and season, their win over USC. Make sure you email us at feedback at irishimpact.com. And give us a follow on Twitter. Our Twitter profile is at Irish Impact. Now it's time for our favorite part of the show. Shout out. Kev, who we got this week? Uh, a couple of our Twitter followers asking for some shout-outs here. You know, Notre Dame, 12-0, and 0, great week. Everyone, I hope, had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Shout-outs this week will be going to Jude Height. He's at Hey Jude, H-E-I-G-H-J-U-D-E. Also, Nicholas Guerin, he wanted to get hooked up with a shout-out. He's at Just a Casual Fan on Twitter. And then there's John Everly. He's at Everly John, J-O-N. And then Steve Akana, I hope I pronounced that correctly. He wants a shout out. He's at Steve Akana, A K A N A. So those are this week's shout outs. If you want to be shouted out, hit us up on Twitter. We're at Irish Impact. You can give Kevin a follow. He's at Money Dubs, M O N E Y D U B S, where you can see an awesome shot of his new custom Notre Dame jersey, an early Christmas present from his brother. <laughs> Very well done. Well yeah. done, Sean. Yeah, I hooked us all up. I have four siblings, three brothers and a sister, 
And he did your got, sister get a jersey? Yeah, sure. She got her custom jersey too. We all got our favorite number. I love the number five. That's having convenient. A, that's having a great season yeah. <laughs> with Everett Golson and then Manti Teo. So, but I, I've been liking number five since I was a kid, and it's just nice to see it this year being so awesomely utilized by the Notre Dame Fighting Irish with a Heisman candidate and a quarterback who's going to be taking snaps under center for probably three more seasons who might be in a Heisman hunt on his own in the future. Let's hope. I have a number nine jersey. I've had a pretty good year. Tommy too. Z? Tome, uh, Toma. It was, I originally got it when Zibikowski wore it. I loved him, too, just because he threw fist. He was a, he just still used to box Yeah, outside. And then um, those side jobs. it became a Kyle Rudolph jersey. Not too bad either. <laughs> now it's transitioned to a Robbie Toma jersey. And a Lewis Nix jersey. That's the one thing beautiful about having a college jersey. It never really expires when it's a Notre Dame team that doesn't yeah. put names on the back. Well, it fits a little more like a Lewis Nix jersey on me than it does a Robbie <laughs> Toma. Robbie Toma? <laughs> yeah. A little heavier than Robbie Toma. I'd call him. I'm a cross between Teow and Golson. Oh, yeah? All <laughs> yeah right. Maybe. <laughs> well, let's talk about a little Manti here because... A couple weeks, uh, I believe December 8th is the night they will unveil the Heisman Trophy winner, Saturday night. It'll probably take an hour, and they'll have probably three players there in New York and probably spend about 20 minutes on every one of them, and it takes forever. Well, yeah, they do a sit-down they got to hype it up, of you course. I get it. Go yada, through their yada, whole yada. life story. they got to have all the commercials for Nissan and Geico and Affleck, whoever sponsors the trophy. I get it. Talk about the, the club. This is the, the homage to the establishment over and over again. Now, the only thing I like about the, the Heisman stuff that I've seen so far this year is a commercial that Nissan did with Tim Brown and Rudy. And we may have mentioned this on the podcast already, but it's so funny to see Tim Brown talking to Rudy about the four horsemen and him being walked off the field on his shoulders. And he sits down next to Marcus Allen, and Marcus Allen goes, you know that's not the real Rudy, right? Yes, Sean Astin, the <laughs> actor from the film. Those commercials are pretty entertaining. I liked the one where um, they're in the the food line, and it's Charles Woodson's behind Archie Griffin, but Griffin, there's two of everything left, and Griffin keeps taking both pieces, both steaks, both pieces of cake. That is pretty good. Yeah, he's got the two pictures, the two massive paintings behind him. Yeah. I do remember that one. Yeah, so that was a good series. But oh, well, getting into this Heisman thing with Manti Teo. He uh, gets three consecutive years now of over 100 tackles. He's the leader on the team. He has a, a record high seven interceptions, one on Saturday night against USC. And most people put him right now at number two behind Johnny Football, Johnny Manziel from Texas A&M. And it's hard to argue only because of Manziel's statistics and how the Heisman generally goes to the best quarterback in college football unless you get a running back who really goes – off the rails with a 2,000-yard season. As we've seen, the award kind of morph in the last decade. It always seems to go to a signal caller. Which I think is stupid. I mean, you well, they already get... have that award. Well, so does Manti. I yeah. mean, they're the best line. I, I agree. But, you know, and Brian Kelly said it this week. If, if you're just going to give it to an offensive player, then that's what they need to, to make it, an offensive award. You know, then they need to come up with, I, I, I don't know, well, there's the one process is stupid. Well, yeah, that's the problem, especially when you see what happened. Like Manziel knows they're in the hunt; they're able to have him blow up on Saturday because he's an offensive player, and you get the ball on every snap at quarterback, right. so you can pad your statistics. As for a middle linebacker, he can, you know, he can make an interception, he can get his tackle, which he but, did, but he can't dictate what is going to happen on every play because the ball's not in his control like a quarterback can. That can just pad his stats. It's like when you see these guys in basketball games that want to go for the scoring title, so they're just right. going to let them score 70 on the last game of the season. And it's not really the spirit of winning the scoring title. Right. So I, Manti has been the leader of this team. He's an inspiration for his teammates. You've seen all these interviews, and you've seen what he's done on the field. He's risen to the occasion time and again in tough pinches for this team. And it's very hard to argue that he shouldn't be the, a front runner for the Heisman Trophy. It's just in a reality he is not because of the way the award always pans out. Which is unfortunate. Um, obviously, we're a little biased here. We both think that he should just win it. Just a pinch. Just a pinch. Just a pinch. <laughs> um, he embodies everything that the Heisen Trophy represents. He's, he's not just a great player on the field, but you, you can argue that off the field, he's the best college football player out there, the best example. 
I, and I, you know, I saw some reports today. There was a report today that Johnny Manziel over the summer was arrested. Again. Not yet. Not in the I, highest I'm not regard. trying to rip on Manziel. He had a great year. 4,600 yards of total offense is pretty remarkable, considering you beat out you know, the likes of Tim Tebow and Cam Newton for most yardage in SEC history. I mean, that, hats off to Manziel. Great award. He's going to have three more chances to win it, though. Yeah, that's the thing. He's a freshman tail, a senior leader on the best Notre Dame team in 20 years, now 25 years, 24 years, going back to the 88 title run. And you have games where he had, in the season, six games with double-digit tackles. He had, I'm counting here, <laughs> six games with interceptions, a multiple interception game against Michigan when he had eight tackles. Right. He's been all over the field in pass coverage and in run defense for a team that's the best defense in the in the BCS football, ranked number one in points allowed. And it's hard to be ignored, to the way this team is played, because when everyone talks about how great this Notre Dame defense is, everyone just talks about Manti Teo. Right. Because he's, the, without a doubt, the leader of the team. They give up just over 10 points a game. It's unbelievable how well they played, considering how everyone had him down Everyone said the schedule was impossible, gauntlet to get through, and they've done it, and it's because of this defensive unit and the leadership of a Manti Teo. Well, let's not forget, too, there was a stretch there for two weeks where he was playing, you know, with a lot of a lot on his mind, you know, his, his grandmother passing away, his girlfriend passing away within 24 hours. I mean, I, don't, I couldn't have been able to play at that level, and the, the fact that he was able to put that and play with that on his mind and, and, and go out there – and he probably had two of his best games of the season all while that was happening. It's tough to argue. I mean, it's it's a stupid process because I think the writers are paying more attention to the glamorous numbers, which are the 4,600 yards and all the touchdowns and the redshirt freshman and yada, yada, yada. But Taylor's way more deserving of this award than – than, you know, than Manzella is. And we probably have the kiss of death today with Skip Bayless writing about it on ESPN.com saying, <laughs> saw that, that. saying oh, that he should be the favorite. I could surprise the sun came out. I was one of the few <laughs> times I agreed with Skip Bayless. But, yeah, it was odd. You know, again, we're, I, we go, we were biased. This is Irish Impact. It's a Notre Dame fan show. But the statistics are there. They're the number one team in the country. He's the most talked about player on the team. How many games did his team lose? Manziel? No, no, no. Manti's. Oh, what do you mean? None, right? Oh, yeah. Number one, undefeated. Yeah. Manziel lost two games. One to a Florida team, another to an LSU team. Just saying. And again, with Notre Dame having questions offensively coming into the year with a freshman quarterback, it was all about the defense with wins 13-6 to over Michigan, a t- one of the t- tougher offenses. We saw what they did against another undefeated team this week. They put up a lot more than six points. And then Stanford holding them to 13. BYU, 14. I mean, Oklahoma, 13 points. That was supposed to be the big shootout, basketball on grass kind of game. And it wasn't. It was just defense. And Manti Teo is the leader of the defense. And he's getting first place votes. The problem is I don't think he'll get enough of them. Well, we want to hear your thoughts on Manti. Obviously, Kevin and I are very biased. All of us here in, in Notre Dame Nation, Irish Nation, we're all biased. We want Manti to win. It's almost a lock that he'll be on his way to New York for the presentation. So in and in, in of itself is, is pretty good. Can you name the last Notre Dame player to make the trip to New York? Brady Quinn. Okay, just make sure. I mean, I knew it was an easy one. but yeah. old Brady. A lot of people have forgotten about Brady, especially in, uh, in that game they play on Sundays. Yeah, well, he tried to get back into it this year, <laughs> but... Wrong team, wrong coach, wrong town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Poor guy. Yeah. Um, but uh, it'll be cool to see him uh, in New York and everybody get a chance to see his story if you, if you haven't heard it, which we all have. But Plus, uh, High's Manti just rolls off the tongue. It does. It does roll off the tongue. It wouldn't hurt the team of destiny to get a Heisman Trophy under their belt before that big title game on January 7th. But, you know, there is, there is history that shows that the Heisman winners – historically do not do well in the bowl game. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have that going for us. And with, you know, one thing with all this being said, Manti Teo does not care about a Heisman trophy. He is 100% focused on what they're going to do in the national title game. 
And now it's going to be interesting to see who that opponent's going to be. They say it's down to two. Nice, nice segue. I like so that. We'll find out. So who do you want them to play? I would like to. I'm honestly would like to see him play Alabama. Oh, be- I want him to play Georgia because of the history there. Notre Dame has played Alabama for national titles before. Notre Dame has come out on top in the past against them. The game would just have a history behind it, and it would be one for the ages as far as TV ratings and everyone watching and talking about this one because it's two storied programs back on top, and they've gone for the title before, and here we are decades later doing it again. See, I'm on And the- I'd like to knock them down a notch. I'm not that afraid of Alabama's everyone seems to say – they could beat an NFL team. Well, not, I, I'm not sure what division Texas A&M plays in on Sunday. <laughs> so I just think they're tough. Without a doubt, whoever they get in this game, it's going to be tough. It's not that I'm afraid of Alabama. It's that Alabama has that experience. You know, They've been there. They know what to expect with everything leading up to it, all the media, all the hype, all that goes into playing a national championship game. They've been there, and they understand how that works. That's where I think they would hold the advantage over Notre Dame. Now, for playing Georgia, they also don't know what to expect. So you kind of eliminate that from the get-go. And so now you're kind of on a, an even playing field because you got two coaching staffs who don't know what to expect going into it. Whereas if you go up against a team like Oklahoma and Nick Saban, who's been there, what, four times now? Mm-hmm. So uh, to me... I think I, I would much rather play Georgia. I think if you're an Irish fan and you want there to be no questions about how good your team is and how legit this championship is, then sure, you want to beat Alabama. But I think I would much rather see them play Georgia, simply be, not just because I think the experience factor, but I just like to see new blood in the in the title game too. You know, like I'm tired of seeing the same teams every year. I was really tired of seeing Oklahoma playing for it every mm-hmm. every year and USC every and year. So back, and going back to Ohio State losing a couple in a row. Oh, that was even worse. Yeah. So for me, I, I personally would like to to see them play some some new teams and I don't know. I mean, it's pretty simple though how it's going to work because these teams are playing each other. The most deserving team will be in the title game because whoever whoever can knock off the opponent this Saturday, you know, they're going to be a tough opponent to face the Irish because they both come in at 11-1. and one. They're both nearly scoring 40 points a game, both pretty good defenses, each with just one loss, and they're going to be ready to go no matter who wins because as much as you talk about the experience of an Alabama, if Georgia's able to beat them, they, they're going to be, believe you, be ready to play for a national championship. Who do you think wins that game on Saturday, though? I mean, it's going to be a tough game. You got, I believe it's in the Georgia Dome, right? Mm-hmm. You got basically a home field advantage for Georgia. Uh, But I think the last time these two teams met actually was in the SEC title game in 2007. I could be way wrong about that. I thought that's what I read over the weekend. But uh, either way, you got two teams, 11-1, and on a roll right now. Um, You would think that the advantage goes to Alabama because, again, they've been there, done that. But I, I don't know. I think Georgia... Georgia has a much better offense than Alabama does, but uh, Alabama may have the advantage on defense. Yeah, I think I'll take Alabama in this one just because the defense, they are actually um, slightly ranked ahead of the Irish in points allowed with just giving up 9.3, so they are the top-ranked defense in points allowed. Alabama giving up just under 8, or excuse me, Georgia giving up just under 18, but again, both teams can score, and I think no matter who comes out of this one, it's going to be close with Alabama just falling to A&M after mounting a comeback that almost won the game before turning it over late. Georgia's only loss was to South Carolina where they got beat up 35-7. A South Carolina team that isn't even – well, they're good, but they're not the same team they were earlier in the year either. Mm -hmm. But, I I mean, sitting here looking at everything, I would pick Alabama as the favorite just because someone has to come through the SEC and prove they are better than Alabama. All right. I'm going to predict Georgia. So okay. you're going Alabama. Sure. No, no friendly wager here? No, I got nothing. All right. Well, we want to hear your thoughts on, uh, on, on everything, whether it be the SEC title game, Florida getting shut out of the whole process. You know, they're 11-1 and one and looking really good right now. How about them Buckeyes, 12-0? and 0? Sorry, suckers. Maybe you shouldn't have sold your gold pants and gotten free tattoos. Yeah, that's a tough one to swallow. But even if they were eligible – the way these computer or the way the system works, they're saying they might be still ranked around five. 
So they, they played a really tough schedule. Yeah, so they wouldn't even – they'd still be on the outside looking in, so it might be easier for them to just accept that they never had a shot at it anyway. That's true. Because you'd be pretty angry if, like, a Notre Dame was unranked and sitting behind three one-loss teams right. and yet from the same conference. So now they know what it feels like to be Boise State. Yeah. <laughs> All those years going undefeated and couldn't even crack the title game. Yeah, it's rough. I mean, that's why you have to do what Notre Dame finally, you know, did. They built up a tough schedule, and were able to go through it all. I would, I, and a lot of people will argue, well, Notre Dame didn't play anybody this year, and I don't think they were counting on Michigan and Michigan State and Purdue to be so down. In fact, the Big Ten overall being as down as it was, um, as it is, you've got the two top teams, and I believe it's the the Legends Division. Sure. Ohio State and Penn State. Yeah, in that aren't even eligible to play for for the the championship game. So to me, you know, I don't think Notre Dame anticipated that. I don't think they anticipated Wake Forest being as bad. They certainly didn't anticipate Boston College being as bad as they were. Uh, Boston College currently looking for a new coach. How about Tom O'Brien from NC State in the axe? Yeah, I mean, what if we'll go back to BC. <laughs> he could. I don't know if he will. I don't right. think he will. But yeah, I mean, it was some of these teams were on down years. Like Miami wasn't the Miami they've been in the past, or neither a decade ago when they won an. National well, Miami title. would have been playing for the ACC title game, but they they uh, sanctioned themselves. They did a little. Uh, what do you call it? A little Ohio State. Yeah, self-imposed right. sanctions. Yeah. So they would have been playing in the ACC title game. So we could have had that. Possibly, but I don't know. The chips fall where they may, and with Notre Dame on top, I'm not that concerned with what happens with even this SEC title game. They're going to play either Alabama or Georgia. It's going to be in Miami. It's going to be January 7th, and Notre Dame is going to be there. And that's all that matters. Let's hope, because here's a chance. Notre Dame this year knocking off the Big Ten, the ACC, the Big East, the Pac-12, Last one on that list is the SEC, and they're going to get the their chance. The almighty SEC. Who will be looking for what? Win number seven in a row in the national championship? I believe so. That is ridiculous to think about. Well, we're going to need a little luck of the Irish to see if we can knock them off the top. Team of destiny, Kev. Well, and that's one last thing we can get into here for the night is that, you know, every it's coming. The college football playoff is coming. Well, who knows how old we'll be when it finally gets put in place, but... <laughs> It's it's going to happen. At least a good one. But the problem is when you have as well as Notre Dame's played, now this hiatus comes. And January 7th, that's a long way away to play your next football game. Right. I mean, it's like it's almost like a whole new season by the time you get there. It is a long time. It gives everybody a chance to rest. It gives everybody a chance to, to get healthy. It gives a lot of people time to look at film, which is good, I think. It's, it gives Notre Dame an advantage. Well, I get nervous when people get time off for big events. It sure as heck did not help my Detroit Tigers in the World Series. Well, that is <laughs> true. It's a whole different sport. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, there, there, are, there are pros and cons to it. Um, I don't know. You don't like all that time off. But I think from a coaching standpoint, you know, Coach Kelly will argue that they're glad it's so long because mm-hmm. now you've given these freshmen who are now basically that's – they're basically sophomores now – more repetitions in practice. They're starting to be be more accustomed to the style of play, the style of practice, how they want to practice. So I think it's good for the for the young guys. Those extra forty five practices or however many it is, you're gonna really see that improvement come spring spring ball and then hopefully that helps jump start them next fall. And I don't want to get ahead and talk about next fall just yet because obviously our season's not over yet. Mm-hmm. But still I think these this time off helps the Irish, not just for January 7th, but moving forward as well. Yeah, and another pro for it is, like, you know who you're playing in the 12 games of the regular season. Now you get enough time to prepare for the ultimate matchup that is your bowl game, Right. no matter what bowl game you're playing and when you make one, because this is a team you never had on your slate, more than likely, unless it is a rematch that some bowl games can become. So then Notre Dame's going to play in Alabama or Georgia. They'll have plenty of time to analyze that football team and what they have to do to try to beat them. You're saying Alabama, I'm saying Georgia. Email us and let us know what you think. Or tweet us at Irish Impact on Twitter. There you go. And yeah, let us know your thoughts of who you think Notre Dame's going to take on after this big Saturday SEC title game. It's a 4 o'clock game. I know that they're going to get a ratings bump from all the Irish fans that will be watching. Oh, I'll be tuning in, that's for sure. And then I'll be heading – well, actually, you know what? I won't be tuning in because I'm heading to Canton oh. to watch 
my alma mater, Big Moeller High School, take on Toledo Whitmer in the state final. How about that? In Division One. It's been 15 years, Kev, since my alma mater played in the state final. Believe it or not, I was on that last team. Hey, how about that? <laughs> Just means I'm old. <laughs> anyway, that's my uh, – and then a little connection, Jerry Faust from? Of course, Notre Dame. That's right. And Moeller High School. Uh, but the, again, uh, I'll be tuning in via radio for sure to, oh, to see what's happening. But again, follow us on Twitter. Hit us up our email address, feedback at irishimpact.com. Episode 14. I think that's going to do it, Kev. Again, everybody, thank you for putting up with my, my awful raspy horse voice. And no game Saturday, Kev, but um, let's see who's going to play us before we try to win the next one for the Gipper. <laughs> Absolutely. Again, our email address, feedback at irishimpact.com. Send us your tweets at irishimpact. For Kevin Wernert, I'm Nick Subling. We'll see you next time on Irish Impact. Irish Impact is an SPNT production. For more information about our other podcasts, log on to SPNT.tv.